Hello everyone, Helen Yu here at IBM Tech Exchange. I'm here with Rob Mason, who is the CTO at Applause, and we're going to talk about how you can get more applause for generative AI today. But before we start talking about this interesting topic, Rob, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, yeah, so I'm Rob Mason. I'm CTO of Applause. I've been with the company about uh, seven years. I joined the company right after acquisition by Vista Equity Partners. So it's been a, a good good time growing and learning uh, with them. And uh, you know, I started off as a developer, actually in hardware, and then I moved into software and went through lots and lots of roles until I started managing teams. And as I managed development teams, and then later I took on QA, I, I developed a passion for QA as well as development. And so uh, for the last Several decades, I've been managing both development teams and QA teams. And uh, when I when Applause found me, it was uh, super interesting that I could do development, still manage a development team, but do a lot of test for the largest enterprise customers in the world. Uh, that's what Applause does. We have uh, the largest testing community in the world mm -hmm. with about a million and a half testers, wow. and we can use them to test customer projects, all sorts of things, websites, mobile apps, AR, VR headsets, smart watches, smart cars, so it's a, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I get, you, I, you're, I get you're to use that passion more, for tests. You're more like Uber for testing, right? That's Very, yeah. Cool. yeah. I, I sometimes use that, but I get in trouble for marketing <laughs> uh, for that one. And then, so I do high tech during the week, low tech on the weekend, I have a horse farm in Massachusetts. Uh, that's my wife's business, farm. so I, I do some some of the light work, uh, farming and, and paperwork, uh, and so that keeps me balanced. That's fascinating, thank you. So let's sure. talk about you know, what IBM technology you're using and how does it enhance Applause offerings? Yeah, so Applause has been around for about 15 years and we've got uh, tons and tons of data uh, that we've collected over those years. And uh, a lot of what we do is engage those testers to test things for our, our customers. Um, and there's a lot of work in there that could be done by machines. We have some machine learning in our system today, um, but it was very painful and it was very time consuming and expensive for us to go down the traditional path because we're, we're really not a data science machine learning shop and we had a very small team for that. Uh, as generative AI came out, uh, it looked like a new opportunity for us and we started looking at some of the independent vendors like Anthropic, OpenAI, um, and uh, we decided that we wanted to go more with someone who had infrastructure that could provide multiple models and more support for us. So then we looked at the bigger vendors, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and IBM, of course. And then eventually we did an analysis and uh, picked IBM. Uh, just the, they, they, they were a fantastic partner through the uh, proof of concept stage. They understood our use case. They partnered with us, gave us actual working code, which nobody else did, um, and uh, showed us how to use Gen AI for our solutions in our business and help us make them successful. So we, you know that's that's the path. So we're right now we're using IBM only for the Watson um, models and uh, and and access and, and all that. Eventually we'll use them as another cloud because we are a multi-cloud already. Mm -hmm. So we'll expand into the IBM cloud as well over time now that we've got that relationship. Well, that's quite a journey, right? <laughs> I actually got engaged with IBM since 2018 for their Watson. At the time, it was really vision. I'm so glad to see that turning into something real today. Yeah, concrete, very. Right? Yeah, exactly. Speaking of generative AI, what are the key factors companies should consider when they um, adopting generative AI? It's, it's a good question. So we have customers that come to us and say, you must use generative AI. They want us to go faster and be smarter and all that sort of stuff. And then we have other customers that come to us and say, don't use it, we're afraid of it, and then don't touch any of our data. So one of the key factors is make sure your customers have the option to go either way. Mm -hmm. uh, give them the choice and don't, don't you know, some co companies are forcing people down the choice path. Uh, and we're, we're still debating that at Applause too. Like do you force adoption and then allow them to opt out or do you uh, only ask them to opt in, and that's that's a, a struggle that a lot of businesses are going uh, through right now. Uh, so that's one thing, but then you know, but definitely give them the choice uh, so they can do that, and then uh, be very up upfront with what models you're using, how they're trained, the pedigree of those models, the pedigree of the companies behind them. Uh, you know, one of the big choices for us with IBM was just you know how well they've researched their models, how well they documented how they're trained, the fact that they're open source, like all of this is super important. It gives uh, much more credibility to know where your data is going or not going in this case. So that, that's, that's super important. Yeah, I did a hands-on lab earlier today. Really enjoyed their model, especially Granite 3. Yeah. Okay? 
Uh, speaking of that, you know, I kind of sit on a couple boards. There's always that fear when it comes to AI, yeah. right? And AI governance. How critical is AI governance? And what's your view on that? And how do how do you actually apply um, build that into your solutions? So we have. Um, so we're our product team, engineering team, and our legal team have convers and, and our infosec uh, team uh, talk frequently around this about how we're going to deploy. Uh, generative AI, where we're going to use it, what data it's going to touch, uh, how that data is retained, like so, all of that is um, baked into our discussions. But um, you know, now the vendors like IBM are starting to introduce governance modules where you can set up rules in place and sort of programmatize uh, or you know systematize uh, those rules so that uh, they're enforced as you're using generative AI. So uh, I think that's super exciting. That's that's pretty new for everybody. So we haven't really got our hands on that yet. Uh, I, I, I saw the announcement the other day and we're looking forward to using that but uh, but we'll definitely be go down that path but again you know involve your legal departments they should be up to speed uh, they have a lot of other things to do around privacy these days but this is just another aspect of privacy that's important yeah there are also a lot of regulations right if you're a global company you have to understand the local um, regulations um, depend on which country you yeah, have we have, we have uh, testers in uh, 200 different countries wow. <laughs> so that's and office it offices in I don't know six or seven <laughs> countries so uh, so we're, we're, we're pretty well spread out. That mm -hmm. way. That's good to hear. So we hear so much about responsible AI these days, right? Everybody talks about it. And as a matter of fact, back in 2019, when I was invited to IBM IT Executive Summit, that was they started talking about responsible AI already. So what is really responsible? What does that really mean? How does the plows build that into your solution? Yeah, so to me, it, that uh, it has a lot to do with bias. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the, you know when I think responsible AI, I think about bias and uh, what what training material is used. And um, at Applause, so how we use it is one way, and then the other thing is what we do for our customers. So Applause actually what we do with lots of testing in lots of different areas, accessibility, usability, but we also do bias testing. And bias is a hard thing to automate or test with machines mm -hmm. because you're getting a sentiment back through the language, and so there often you want people from lots of different demographics, different regions, different races and ethnic ethnicities and all that to read the output and say this appears to be fair and balanced or it's not, it's biased, it's leaning one way consistently. But you want, you have to have a pretty broad set of people to look at that. Um, it's very hard to test with automation. So that that's where we think, you know, we, you want to make sure that what's coming back is, bi is not biased, that it is a, a logical answer. You're, you're asking a machine for something. If you want it to have an opinion, then you should. that should be part of your instructions, but it shouldn't be a default mode that is taking a particular point of view on things. It should be factual. And we expect when we're talking to machines for them to come back and be factual, but when they come back and they're leaning one way or the other on a point of view uh, because they've been trained incorrectly or they don't have enough training material from you know, different sides, then it's, um, that's not very balanced and it's, it's not the way it should be. And, you know, if you want it to, again, like I said, if you want it to be a certain way, tell it to be that way and then let it go and, and have it be biased, but the default shouldn't be that. And, and that's, uh, and so the responsible is training on data sets that are balanced, mm -hmm. that are accurate, that are factually accurate. And that's, you know, that's hard because people are scraping the internet, and there's there's so much data going into these algorithms these days that it's it's hard to know. Well, did did that data set that I get is it balanced? And you know that's where companies like IBM are spending a lot of money and time to make sure those data sets are balanced. And they're also coming out with you know like the Granite models. They've just introduced Granite three. They're smaller models, mm -hmm. so you can actually influence them yourself with your own data sets. And that's possible because they're small enough that's, that, that it, that's, it, that's possible. Whereas the big ones, you know, they're, they're already way too much training in it to, yeah. to, to change how they think. Well, that, you know, we've advanced so much, right? Since back in the days when I deployed AI uh, <laughs> at global banks, because at the time when you train a data model, it could take half oh, a yeah. day, right, yeah. for the data to return. Now, with robust computing power, things are going so much faster. And I'm glad, you know, we're doing that in a responsible way. Yeah. So, Rob, what's next with IBM partnership? So we've got we've got a long laundry list of areas in our product that we want to uh, touch with generative AI. So our product team has worked on a a multi-year roadmap of, of uh, features and things they want to do there. Um, we've already done a few and, and launched those into production, and we have uh, other ones that are in progress now. 
Uh, so we're looking forward to how those touch learning and, and going down that path as we go. Uh, within our system, like so we have a, a modern SaaS enterprise grade uh, system, and there we'll have a central uh, AI service that is basically the gateway to IBM's Watson models and, and all that. But that way the other areas of our system can leverage that one common service so that everyone doesn't have to do a direct integration to Watson, that they can, they can go through that centralized service. So um, that centralized service, we have a few flavors of it now from the early days, we're, we're making it more robust, and then we're doing features on top of that. Uh, but it's going to save applause money, save our customers money, allow our testers to work on more interesting things because they, they do a lot of uh, repetitive things that aren't as interesting. So we'll let them work on more interesting things. We still need them. We still have a lot of work for them to do. Uh, there's no end to that. But uh, the less interesting things, the things that are repetitive, we'll have the machines do for us. So, uh, and that's where, you know, when I look at generative AI, a lot of people are afraid of losing jobs and all that. And I, to me, it's a, if the AIs can do it, it, it's freeing up people to do more creative, uh, more cerebral things, uh, things that are still important, things that the AIs can't do. So uh, to me, it's, it's a great age and I'm excited about it. I think it'll make lives, you know, our customers will be very happy about it. Our testers will be happy. Um, and we have a lot of work to do, but I'm excited to get yeah. my hands on all that technology. Likewise here. So. Well, since we're talking about how to get more applause for generative AI, <laughs> what is your advice for people who want to get more applause for generative AI? I, I, so hands-on uh, is, is like I'm, I'm still a developer. Uh, you know, I've been doing it for decades. <laughs> um, so hands-on for sure. And if you're not a programmer, um, get into the prompts. Like you know, just ask questions, ask tricky questions. Uh, do that not not with just IBM's uh, Watson, but with all the other things out there, so you can see how they respond. Because different models do different things. And, um, and some of them are very particular about how you ask questions, some of them are not, some of them are biased as we talked about, some of them are not. So that to me is like try all the different things, see that spectrum, and then find what fits for your use case. Mm -hmm. And then refine it, preferably find a great partner that's gonna work with you, like that's for us, that was a big thing with IBM, is that they, they would partner, so when we get stuck, they help us out. And not everyone has the time or resources. A lot of these vendors are moving. I mean, IB, even IBM, if they're moving 100 miles an hour, but they still find time to work with you. So that you, you know, definitely, if you don't have a big team, uh, you know, our team is not very big. But you know, if you don't have a big team, find someone who can help you down that journey. Get hands-on, get the experience, and not just in engineering. Product has to do that. Legal should have experience. The rest of the business should be tying into it and, and using it for writing, you know, sales outreach emails or writing. You know, board slides or you know any of those things. Like, there's lots of places that can help accelerate people, but you got to find the, the patterns that work best for you. Yeah, I agree. I think learning by doing, right? That's <laughs> exactly. really as of IBM Tech Exchange. So, my last question here: What's your favorite part of IBM Tech Exchange? So, uh, I met some really smart people here, um, uh, like PhD fellows, or, or uh, and um, the the one statement that stuck with me mm -hmm. is. Um, I, I forget his name, and I'm embarrassed about that. But uh, so he said, um, in, in the early days, uh, we had data science and machine learning, and it was all based on your data. Mm -hmm. It was all data based, mm -hmm. and now we have generative AI, which is based on somebody else's data. Mm -hmm. And so your data is outside, and, and you know we're talking about rag data patterns and loading them in now. But that's band aids right now. Mm -hmm. So there's we went from everything that was based on your own data to stuff that's much smarter, but not based on your data. We need to get to that third phase, which is that smarts with your data. Mm -hmm. And we're not there yet. We don't have the databases, we don't have the connections, the Gen AIs aren't plugged in. So that next phase is uh, looking forward to the future. And, um, and IBM's already got their eye on that ball. And they've got database expertise, they've got great um, large language models, they've got super smart people. So that, like hearing that vision was really exciting for me and it, it just clicked because I've, I've already lived those other two paths and, I'm, and I can see that there's something missing right now, but mm -hmm. I know that IBM is working on solving, solving that pattern. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's exciting to think about it because we might be running out of real data by 2026, right? And with that capability, we can do so much more. Right. I'd say synthetic data as well. Yeah. Right? Well, thank you so much, Rob, for Thank the you. Time. Thanks for having me. I really hope, appreciate it. Yeah, I hope I'll see you again <laughs> next year. Okay, thank you.